Uh, and uh, furthermore, the snail is a very slow snail. He can only move one millimeter in a million years. Okay, oh. so he, uh, he's going to take a little while to get this done, okay? To move the entire Earth to the other side of the universe, assumed to be 16 billion years away. Now, suppose you're the engineer and you, uh, you have a protein factory that produces uh, 400 tons of proteins a second uh, in... Now you're really cranking out the proteins, okay, uh, as uh, with uh, left-handed and right-handed amino acids. 400 tons of proteins already. You've you've jumped over the impasse, the barrier. You've granted the proteins, and you're cranking these out at 400 tons a second. And so here's the the issue: is that uh, our protein plant will have filled the entire universe with uh, proteins, none of which are viable, by the way. Uh, before one possibly one is viable and still the snail will have won the race in producing uh, uh, in uh, moving the entire earth to the other side of the universe and back oh my now this communicates to the audience here you you've jumped over the impasse of these left and right handed amino acids and you've granted to the evolutionists uh, that okay you can somehow produce proteins okay uh, but they have to be viable so to get one viable protein with which to start a spark of life, but you need a lot more than protein to start right. the spark of life, he produces, you give him a factory producing 400 tons of proteins per second, and uh, he, would, uh, he can fill the universe with these proteins uh, to get one viable protein, but the snail moving, how fast? Uh, one millimeter... Uh, in a million million years. In a million years to move the Earth to the other side of the universe. But somehow, according to the mathematical odds, you say, and it has been demonstrated, that the snail will move the Earth to the other side of the universe one millimeter uh, each and grain, that's just using each molecule. The, the, the figure that uh, was given, uh, and this is a very generous figure that yes. uh, he has given to it. He, he would win the race against producing one single viable protein. Doug, you're telling me that Stanley Miller and Harold Urey did not produce life in a test tube. They produced a few amino acids. Which is uh, not life. Racemic amino acids, of which I had in, in my uh, off-the-shelf uh, chemicals. The left and right-handed, which do not work in life. That's life right. only uses the left-handed. Now, in these closing moments, I'd like for you to read the direct statement of Harold Urey decades after this experiment, which he and, and Stanley Miller were purported to have created life in a test tube. Have they? Would you read his direct statement in a confrontation published? Okay, uh, there was a, uh, a symposium that was done at, uh, in Lansing uh, where Harold Urey was invited, and he, uh, uh, he had a question and answer period after his uh, presentation, which, by the way, uh, the arguments in it seem quite dated now, but I, I thought it was interesting. It's, but here's what the question was. In the biochemical uh, scheme for the formation of life, I guess people uh, uh, have worked under you, have developed or synthesized amino acids and some proteinoid so substances. Characteristics of these substances are, is the fact that they're always isomer mixtures. All I, uh, life is characteristically optically active or made up of optically active compounds. How would you account for the formation of optically active biochemicals from racemic mixtures by chance? Left and right handed. And here's what he says. Well, I have worried about that a great deal, and it is a very important question, and I don't know the answer to it. Characteristically, as I say, I tell my scientific friends to go back and work on it, and maybe 10 years from now, maybe 100 years from now, we will understand it better than we do now. You won't understand it any better by simply by saying that God did it. You will still be saying that uh, 10 years from now, and you will find many people who will puzzle about it, but uh, I would make, that, uh, make this suggestion. Uh, and he, he just goes on and, uh, and, and, and just, just punts, on this away. Whole, uh, punts on this whole question. That's when I asked Doug Sharp about this. 
he stated, well, what he really did was punt on the whole question. Doug was involved in writing articles in the production, uh, stage production of Inherit the Wind. Now, as we conclude this material, Inherit the Wind, of course, ultimately states there's real credence to evolutionary hypothesis. The Stanley Miller experiment states, not only is there credence to evolutionary hypothesis, the building blocks of life have actually been created naturalistically in the test tube. But we found on today's program, what they created are amino acids that are, act some of which are actually found in the polycarbonates uh, out in space. That takes us nowhere. They're racemistic. That is, they're left and right-handed, but life only uses left handed amino acids in the building as the building block of life but then you get a viable protein beyond that beyond the protein you must get sixty thousand of them in a specific configuration to inhabit one functioning cell was life created at the university of chicago in 1952 in the miller urey experiment no but life was created in a body, in a form, in the Garden of Eden. All the materials were placed together. And even with all the materials, including the ingredients in the proteins, it still required the breath of God to bring it to life. That's what we're finding as we examine the test tubes. God loves you. Would you like to know him? Pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come into my heart. I need you. Save me, and I will serve you with all my heart. Creation in the 21st Century has been sponsored by Trinity Broadcasting Network. And only with your love gift of support can this program stay on the air. So write to Creation in the 21st Century, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Creation in the 21st Century is a unique program on TBN combining biblical knowledge with scientific verification. Much of the information that I use on the program is available. Contact us. Just write Creation Evidence Museum, P.O. Box 309, Glen Rose, Texas, 76043, or call us at 254-897-3200. We look forward to hearing from you today.